Hello everyone and thank you for coming to my talk, Write Docs That Devs Love, 10 Tips or Tricks to Level Up Your Tech Writing. My name is Mason Egger and I'm a developer advocate at DigitalOcean. So before we get into the tips and tricks that I have, let's talk a little bit about technical writing and more specifically, what is technical writing? Um, think of a piece or a tutorial or some documentation that you've worked on before in the past uh, that you just really liked, like you you typed it all through, you followed it word for word, and then you ran it, and it ran exactly the way you expected it to. And just think of like that feeling of like, yay, I got it to work, and you were excited about it. And now think about another form of uh, documentation where the it's sparse, you can't really tell what's going on, you're trying what's going on, but it's not working, and you're just getting overly and overly frustrated. And I'm sure that just as you've probably experienced a good piece of documentation before in the past, it's also likely that you've also experienced documentation like this. Um, both of these are products of technical writing. So what is the difference though? What makes one better than the other? Why why do you like one and dislike another? And you can it doesn't even have to go with the fact that maybe one was wrong and one was correct. Maybe you had two tutorials that were both technically correct, but you just like this style of tutorial better. What is that? Well, we actually kind of have some insights into what makes good tutorials. Um, so, you know, from a definition standpoint, what is technical writing? Technical writing is instructional or informative writing that focuses on how to accomplish a task using a specific tool, programming language, framework, etc. Uh, these tools can be hardware, they can be software, it can be anything and everything in between. It can be a power drill. You know, that is still technically technical writing because it's instructing you how to do stuff. So why is technical writing important? Well, there's a lot of reasons why technical writing is important. Um, usually it is the first impression that someone has of your project and you want them to have a good impression of your project so they come back and decide to, you know, use it and enjoy using your project. If they don't like it, they will move on and find another tool. This happens all the time. Actually, in today's day and age, if a, you, a person cannot get to a working project within your project relatively quickly, they will go and find another one. It's a very short amount of time that they will give you the opportunity to figure out what is going on. Um, it teaches users about a new project or code that they didn't already know about. So they may not know about this certain specific language or framework or something, and technical writing will be their introduction to it. Um, when was the last time that you found a new project or a new, new piece of uh, code just by browsing the source code? And I don't mean going on GitHub and reading the readme. Readmes count as uh, technical writing, technically. I'm talking about you just went in, you opened up, something.py and you're like, oh, I really like this. When was the last time you found code like that? Now, it's not impossible that you have found code like that, but at the same time, it's also more probable that you found it by looking at documentation of some sort, of technical writing of some sort. Um, it teaches users how to use your project effectively and safely, and this is very important. Um, we don't deal with it as much in the software space, but it does happen. We There are people who work on technologies where if an improper use of a library or an improper use of the tool can result in bodily harm. Imagine if you are a technical writer for your vehicle and you wrote up a manual that said, fill up the tire with air, instead of saying, fill up the tire with air to 35 pounds per square inch or PSI. That little bit of exclusion at the end, if you left that off, someone could potentially overfill the tire, cause it to rupture, and potentially do damage to themselves. So being able to effectively and safely guide your users is extremely important. And it helps build communities around your projects. It's likely to bring people back. People that read your documentation and that like it will come back and say, hey, I really liked this documentation. Uh, people will want to contribute. You know, people like contributing to projects that are well-maintained, that they enjoy, and part of documentation is part of that experience. People will tell their friends about the project, you know, oh, hey, look, yeah, I love using X project because the documentation makes it so easy to use. Um, an example of this is, you know, the company that I work for. I work for DigitalOcean. We're very well known in the open source space for the community tutorials that we put out. People come back to us time and time again. Even before I worked there, I would go back to DigitalOcean time and time again to talk about tutorials because, or to read these tutorials because they're just that good and they've garnered that trust. So let's move into my top 10 tips for improving your technical writing. Uh, a quick disclaimer, these are my tips and tricks. 
Um, these are what have helped me after spending two years writing tutorials and working alongside professional editors at DigitalOcean. These are some of the things that I have picked up. Um, just because something that maybe you like doesn't make the list does not in any way make it invalid. There are so many good things about technical writing and so much that can be done about it that if these are just my 10 and I will tell you it was really hard to do just 10. It was very tough for me to narrow it down. If I had written this talk the way that I had, uh, you know, we'd have an hour long talk and it would be Mason's top 45 tips on technical writing, that wouldn't work. So I decided to narrow it down to 10. So without further ado, let's move on to our first tip, which is tip number 10, make your end goal clear. So in your tutorial, in your documentation, in anything that you're writing, have a clear, concise goal in your documentation in the first paragraph explaining to the user what it is they're going to accomplish. Example, this library allows you to do X. In this tutorial, you will use X and Z to build Y, and I said that backwards. So let them know upfront what they're going to do. This sets the expectation, this sets the, sta spade, the stage, and everything is good with that. If you're writing a tutorial, don't spend a thousand words telling your reader how great the, the technology is. So making your end goal clear is important, but also if you're writing it, like don't go on a four paragraph tangent on how great and the history of this tech, not technology that it is, there, the user probably doesn't care much about that, unless of course this piece is meant to be a historical piece. But they're already at your tutorial, they're already using your stuff, they already know how great it is, they don't need you to ramble on. Imagine it's like those recipes where you have to, where you go and you look up a recipe online and it tells you the entire backstory of this person's family lineage all the way back to the 1400s and how this was great, 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 great grandma's recipe. What do most people do? We all scroll through that and get to the actual instructions. It's the exact same thing with tutorials and instructions and stuff like that. People just want to get stuff done. They don't really necessarily care about the backstory of it. That's a good point for a blog post. That's a great blog post or historical context piece. Not so great in a tutorial. Um, your reader, yeah. So make it blatantly obvious what your reader will have learned, built, accomplished, understood, whatever, by the end of reading your documentation. Set the goal, set the stage up front, and set your reader up for success. Don't be overly verbose. Tip number nine. Technical documentation should be concise, not a novel. If you want to write a tech novel, go for it. There are a lot of them and they are hilarious. There's a lot of really funny technical novels that are out there and I really highly recommend you reading some and looking into them. But don't make your tutorial a novel, don't make your documentation a novel. That kind of documentation belongs somewhere else. SAT words are not needed here. Upper level reading level, college level reading level, these words do not need to be here. Always assume that the reader of your documentation doesn't speak the same language as you, that the, you, the language that you are writing in is not their primary language. This will help in a lot of regards. It will allow you to aim for a lower reading level, which is, you know, we've all been like, oh, reading level, we should aim high for that. No, in documentation, aim low. Tools like Grammarly and this one tool called Hemingway app, which you can see in the top right hand corner, give you this estimated reading level. And the reason we wanna have a lower reading level is because if English or if whatever language you're writing in is not the reader's first language, they're probably, they may potentially be struggling. They may have just learned that language. And by lowering the reading level, you've made it easier for non-native speakers who maybe not be as versed in, a, in this language to read your documentation. And it won't affect or in any way negatively like affect the people who are native speakers. They'll just go, oh, this is really simple and easy to read and they will go through it. It's a win-win. It doesn't affect the, sp the people who speak the, the language natively and it, and it helps the people who don't speak the language natively. And it's just a great way to do it. Um, personally, I always aim for a third grade reading level and that may seem low, but it's great. It's to the point. It tells you exactly what you need to do. There's no like six syllable words in all of that stuff. I aim really low to ensure that people can understand it and people love that type of reading, that kind of type of documentation. The highest though, I will allow myself to go is sixth grade reading level. Sometimes these things can be more, documentation these things can be more um, complex and it's kind of difficult to scale it down, but always aim for a lower reading level. Don't make your tutorials and documentation overly verbose. It doesn't help anyone, it just confuses people. Tip number eight. Use inclusive language. 
So avoid gender language and go for more general neutral pro pronouns. If you have an example of someone in your thing, you know, don't say he did this or she did this. Say they did this. Go for a gender neutral approach. Um, and don't be afraid to use second person. It's totally fine to say next you will as almost like a commanding statement. That's totally fine in documentation. The user is fine with this the t in, in tutorials as well. The user is fine with being told next you will set up a Python virtual environment. That's totally fine. You don't have to go in any other detail than that. Um, if you're looking for second person plural, I love the word y'all. And I think it's a great testament to the English language. And um, I have another talk about that where I talk about just the greatness of second person plural. Uh, but that's a different talk for another day. Avoid using internet slang that can be viewed as derogatory. Now this is not saying like, obviously avoid any sort of derogatory statements, but some statements you may not know uh, or feel make, make, make people feel uncomfortable or unwelcome. Noobs, 10x developers, dummies. There's an entire uh, set of books that are blank for dummies, marketing for dummies, did, uh, developers for dummies. And while some people love those books, I personally think that they're very well written and put up, some people automatically shut them out because they don't like being called a dummy or a noob or anything like that. So avoid using these kind of like internet slang words that may not necessarily be overly offensive, but they will definitely, um, you know, cause some of your readers to not feel comfortable and maybe they won't like it and they won't read it. So just avoid this. There's no, there's nothing to be gained from using this type of language. There's, and there's everything to be lost. So just don't do it. Um, I've seen things like top 10 JavaScript, top 10 tips for JavaScript noobs. And I'm like, Ugh, why? why? Why not say JavaScript beginners? Why, where, where, why was noobs a better choice than beginners? It wasn't. So, yeah. Anyway, avoid words that can make someone question or doubt their skills. So don't say words like simple or easily. This might be challenging to someone else. What you consider simple could be considered challenging. And by doing this, by saying simply do this, if you say simply do this on a task that someone doesn't understand, it makes them feel lesser. Maybe they think that, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this tutorial. Maybe this isn't for me. Um, that would be like saying simply install Python from source. There's no simple part about that. Some people can probably do it in their sleep. Others would, like myself, I've never done it before, so I wouldn't know how to do it off the top of my head. I would not in any way, shape, or form see that as a simple task. So avoid words and languages that can make people doubt their skills. It just doesn't, like, you can just remove the simply. Like, it's not like you need that word there. Install Python from source. The simply adds nothing to that statement whatsoever. All it does is make someone feel a little bit lesser it's a useless word. Don't add it there. Tip number seven, limit technical jargon. This is a big one. So what is jargon? It's kind of funny that I use jargon in a jargon slide. Jargon are special words or expressions that are used by a particular profession or group and are difficult for others to understand. Um, we have a lot of that in tech. It's everywhere. Overuse of jargon can make it difficult for beginners to grok your content. See how I used grok there? See what I did there? Grok. Why was that there? Why did that need to be there? Couldn't we have just said understand? It would have been universally more accepted. Why did I do that? Yeah, don't use it. Don't use words like grok. Um, I mean, you can if you want to, but I'm just saying in this instance, you know, it didn't really, it didn't really add to it and all it did was add confusion. You, the whole point of documentation is to be clear. Um, knowing your audience will allow you to help decide how much jar jargon you can actually use. So I'm not saying don't always use it. I'm saying limit it. If it's a brand new set, like, if it's a brand new piece of documentation for beginners, it's not a good thing to be using it. But if you're writing this for say, like an internal team, like this, it's your six developers that work on this, you can probably use some jargon related to the system. It's expected that those engineers will understand it. I, in my experience, the wider the audience you go, the less jargon you should use. If it's a super narrow set, you can use some jargon. If you are going to a worldwide audience or a global audience, I would limit it as much as possible. Um, assume beginners if you don't know your audience. So this kind of goes with the whole global thing. If you don't know who your audience is, like, or you're not 100% positive who your audience is, then go with it just being uh, beginners. And that will, that will guide you all the way through it and will get you where you need to be. Uh, beginners will appreciate you for not putting it in. And experts just skim over documentation anyway. They won't notice that it's missing. Um, you can also have a statement stating who your documentation is for. This is very common. It's like, this tutorial is for so-and-so. Like, you need to have this level of experience and you need to have these prerequisites before you do this tutorial. Doing something like this 
will inform the reader up front and then allow you to just continue on with it. So tip number six, define all of your acronyms. Tech has way too many acronyms. It's one of my least favorite parts of tech and it's actually a part that I struggled with for a very long period of time in my career. Um, we even have some acronyms that can have two or more meanings depending on the context. Now we have context clues acronyms and that's just terrifying just to think about. Um, acronyms can easily scare readers away. Whenever there's a whole bunch of letters that don't make any sense, people get frightened, they go away because they don't feel like they understand anything about the ecosystem and they can't deal with it. So new learners are very often are intimidated and, and feel insecure when it comes to tech and these acronyms just really make it bad for you. Um, there are many ways of solving this. So one way you can do it is write out the full name of the acronym when you introduce it. So you'll need to add a record to the domain name system, DNS, comma, DNS. Go there, you've defined what it is, and then you have given the acronym. And now you're kind of okay to continue forward using it. Um, if you plan on using this acronym for the rest of the documentation, say so. You need to add a record to the domain name system or DNS. We'll refer to the domain name system as DNS for the rest of this tutorial. Putting that one sentence in there will, exp will let your reader know that this is just how, this is what this acronym is, this is what it means, and we're going to use this for the rest of our tutorial. It's great. Um, or you can define all acronyms used in the tutorial at the beginning or the end, in like an appendix or, I guess, pre-appendix? I don't know what it's called. And link them back when you use them. Like, I just have them anchor and link back, or like if you hover over it, have it pop up and explain it. It's a great way, a little bit of interactivity, makes it a really good experience. Tip number five, avoid memes, idioms, and regional language. So avoid using memes and idioms unless you are, once again, positive who your audience is. Um, for those of you that don't know what an idiom is, an idiom is a group of words established uh, by usage as having a meaning not deducible from those of the individual words. Well, that was hard to say. Um, and I wrote this. <laughs> uh, so basically things like pull out all the stops, or it's a piece of cake, or that's going to cost an arm and a leg. These are not things that non-native speakers would understand. It's things that sometimes even some even native speakers won't understand. Um, so if you're using these idioms, they don't li literally make any sense. Like it's it's a colloquialism. It's part of the culture. But you can't assume that everyone who's reading your docs shares the same culture as you. Um, so putting them in here really does kind of muddy the waters. So just avoid using them. They're fun. I like them. I understand. I tend to use them in my presentations. Whenever I'm doing presentations at conferences, I will use memes. I'm, I like using memes in that. Um, that, that, that can be That can go either way, but definitely I would avoid using them in documentation. Uh, it's again, it's, you have not, you have nothing to gain except for maybe a chuckle and you have everything to lose by completely losing someone. So there's not really much benefit to using them. Um, your six coworkers that you are, that you are around will probably understand these. A global audience of people who have may have never seen SpongeBob may not get the, the SpongeBob uppercase lowercase meme. They may not understand that because maybe they've never seen it. Maybe they're not versed in the internet culture. So you definitely want to avoid that. But this is all going back to know your audience. Once again, if you are, if you're writing for an internal team and you know who your six teammates are and you know that they will get this reference, there's nothing wrong with using it there. But as you go more global, I would use less. Um, avoid using re regional language that might confuse both native and non-native speakers. There's a big example example that I can think of because I, my native language is English, is some of the differences between American English and uh, European English, specifically the English that's spoken in the United Kingdom, but there's even the difference between the language speak, spoken in America and in Canada. There's just words that don't they, that don't mean the same thing in different areas. So, like performing this command will totally trash your system. That one seems completely obvious to me, but maybe someone doesn't know that. Maybe they don't like trash. Like my system will get dirty. No, that means it will destroy your system. But we don't like trash in you know the literal sense means dirty. So how would someone not know that? Or this one, like, don't use this library, it's dodgy. Uh, that's U United Kingdom uh, English. That's not really a word that's spoken here in America, American English vernacular that much. So, uh, I mean, while, while I can deduce it, I didn't necessarily understand it all the time. I actually looked it up and it was not exactly what I thought it meant. So just avoid regional languages. These are known as colloquialisms, but just try to avoid the regional language because it will, it could confuse both people, you know, native and non-native speakers. Um... Just be straightforward. It'll work out every time. Um, use meaningful code samples and variable names. Tip number four. 
Use examples of real world world problems that your code can solve. Um, readers want to know what your problems your code solves, show them. Like they, they came to your library to solve a problem, show them exactly the things that you are the most proud of it solving. Very often readers just skim the thing and they just skip to the code. And if you have a good example that just explains it, they might just, your entire documentation, that all that stuff you've written, they might only read the code block. Think of how many times you've gone to Stack Overflow and you've copy and pasted something and there was a description, there was an explanation or a description underneath and you didn't even read it, you just copied the code and left. You didn't read what it did because you're like, oh yeah, that kind of looks correct, let's just try it. It's the exact same thing here. So use examples because people are going to want to copy and paste your examples. Um, use meaningful variable names. We all say that code should be self-documenting. We all say this, like, you know, the, the variable names should make the method names and the function names should make it self-documenting. That's true. If that's the case, then well, the documentation should be self-documenting as well. Um, the foo and bar are useless. They need to go. We never, I never want to see foo and bar in documentation again. They mean nothing. Um, unless you actually are doing, maybe it, maybe you're a bartender and you have a drink called foo. But other than that, it's useless. Don't use it. Um, include everything that is needed to run the code. How many times have I looked at library documentation and it doesn't tell me how to import the library? Um, so remember to include things like importing the documentation. If you need to have a file open, show that as well, or at least put some comments there, but don't just do, you know, just the bare minimum. Add everything that is needed for that code block. All code blocks should be self-sustaining and should be able to run by themselves as singular pieces. Always have a completed copy of code for copy and pasting. So if you're doing a tutorial and you're walking through this long Python script, you're like, these lines do this, these lines do this, these lines do this. That's great. And explaining them in depth will definitely help the reader. But at the very end, you should have one large code block with the entire code and they can simply copy and paste out. This helps for two reasons. One, it lets people just see the scope. It lets them see it at the end. Uh, and they know what it is. Two, if they mistyped something, instead of having to go and figure out where they copy it, they can just copy the whole thing and make sure that it runs. Also, if you're using some like advanced code um, testing tools, like Sphinx has the ability to do doc tests and stuff, you could technically test that documentation and make sure that it actually works and like run the code to test to make sure the docs work. So that's a really good advantage as well. Tip number three, don't make your reader leave your docs. So avoid sending your reader to many other site links, making them leave your tutorial to go somewhere else to learn something that they need for your tutorial. Everything necessary to complete the task should be within the article. Um, copying a few steps from another set of documentation is going to be better than sending the user to many different sites. How to install this library, like pip install numpy. Don't go, oh, install, install numpy, here's the docs when it could have just been pip install numpy or conda install numpy. Like don't, why not just write that line? Don't send them somewhere else because the likelihood of them making it back is kind of low. As soon as someone leaves your site, they may not always make it back and you want them to make it back. That's why you wrote the documentation. It's meant there to be read. Um, if you are going to send people off of your article, have a reason and a way to do them back. So this is very common in DigitalOcean's tutorials. We um, do it at the beginning. If we're going to send you outside of the tutorial, we do it at the beginning and we list it as a set of prereqs. You need to have this installed. So if you're doing like securing Ubuntu on 18, Ubuntu 18.04, a web server using CertBot or something like that, the tutorial that we'll have is one of the prerequisites is have a setup installed Ubuntu and it leads to another one of our tutorials that shows you exactly how to do it. So they don't really technically leave your site, they just go to a different tutorial. So if you're gonna send people somewhere, do it at the beginning and say, these are the prerequisites you need to complete the tutorial. Once you start the body of the tutorial, do not send somewhere someone else if you can absolutely avoid it. Um, link out to these, link out to all these prerequisites and let make sure the reader, direct the reader where to learn, how to come back, what to do, all of that. Um, don't say, just go install Python. Link them to something that will lead them up to success. Don't say for prereqs, install Python, no. Here's a tutorial on how to install Python on Windows. Send them to that, it definitely helps. Uh, the, one of the other advantages of this, this also allows you to control the environment in which they write in. So very often when you're writing documentation and stuff, you can't always control the environment. You don't know what is gonna be set up, what's not gonna be set up. But if you have a prerequisite, you need to have an environment set up. Here's how you do it. Then you can write your entire tutorial for that specific environment. And if they followed all of it, it'll work. 
a neat little tip and trick. Uh, tip number two, make your content scannable. Make it easy for readers to find a single piece of information. Beginners tend to read entire posts top to bottom, while experienced users scan until they find the information they need and then they leave. Uh, use headings and subheadings to break up your content. So organize it. Don't just make it one blob of text. Step one, install Ubuntu. Step two, install Nginx. Stuff like that. Um, outline your big changes, such as the next step. Or if you're going to change your context, maybe that's a subheading. Or if you're going to go off and on a tangent, that's also a subheading. Do it like that. Um, when paired with the table of contents, this allows you the users to find what they're looking for much, much easier. Uh, use consistent style when writing. So make sure that you're using the same style that you always use and don't switch between person, different, like, different narratives, like first person, third person, second person. Like Pick a style, stick with it. Also, make sure that what you're doing towards certain types of stuff within your documentation is the same. So make library names bold, and every library name will be bold, and make file paths in italic. This is an example. Um, but what happens is the user quickly picks up on these style things, and then the, as they're scanning, as they scan your document, they their eyes immediately focus on it, and they can find exactly what they need. So pick a consistent style. Don't make a library bold over here, and italics over here, and in a code block over here, and camel case over here. That's not going to help, and it's just going to make the library, the, the documentation confusing. Go through it all and pick a consistent style guide and just be consistent. That's all it is. Consistency is key. Your style is your style. Do it, but do it well and do it consistently and you'll have much better documentation for it. And finally, tip number one, verify your instructions. Test, test, test. Always verify your instructions and test your work. The only thing in my mind worse than no documentation is incorrect documentation. I'd rather just not have it at all, to be honest. Um, incorrect documentation, it, it, it serves no one and it actually works against you because now people can't use your product, they're not getting it to work well, and they're frustrated and they're going to leave and they're not coming back. Um, if possible, have someone else test your code who you, who you work with. So make sure that they have someone else test it. Um, having an editor, a peer, a teammate, or even a friend just walk through the documentation will help you find lapses because you get a bias. You get a judgment. You've been writing this all and you'll do things second naturely that you didn't know you were doing and then it goes through that way. And you you know, you, you're just blind to it. So have someone else do it. They won't have the same blinds. Um, use a fresh environment for testing. Attempt, this was really important. You need to attempt to remove all bias from your development environment. Your shortcuts, the packages you have installed, maybe at the system level, tools that you might have might not be on the reader's workstation. So your environment that you've been developing this thing in is potentially tainted. So you need to do it on a fresh environment to make sure that those things actually work. Um, you can do this with virtual machines. You can do this with cloud servers. You can do this any way you want, even different virtual environments sometimes, but you gotta be careful with the virtual environment one. Still, you could have still accidentally installed a library into System Python and not really known about it, and now it's working, but it doesn't work in the tutorial for everyone else. So always test. And bonus tip, practice, practice, practice. The best way to get better at technical writing is to write. It's the same way with them. The best way to get better at coding is to code. Best way to get better at playing a musical instrument is to play the musical instrument. With writing, it's the same thing. Write stuff. Set aside time in your daily week, daily or weekly um, to just write. Sit down, write for 30 minutes, write a blog, write some instructions, do something. You don't have to publish it. Just because you write it does not mean it needs to be seen by the world. I have a lot of stuff that I've written that I've never published because I don't like it. I just, I wrote it because it was some thoughts and then I look at it and I was like, that doesn't make any sense, but I got practice while doing it. And also, don't throw it away. Save it in a folder. You never know when you might want to dust it off. You never know when you might want to go back and reflect on it. So if you're going to be doing all this writing, definitely don't throw it away. So those are my tips. How can you get started in technical writing? So say now you're inspired. You want to go. How can you get going with this? Um, write documentation at work. There is always something that needs to be documented. There is never a lack of documentation that needs to be done. Start a blog. Starting a blog is fun. It can be freer. This is where you can go wild and not have a style guide or just write to your heart's content. You can write tutorials that are technical and blog posts that are not. This allows you complete creative freedom, um, and it's great for practicing. You can contribute to open source projects. 
Hacktoberfest is here. I work for DigitalOcean. We do Hacktoberfest. It's here. It's a great time to get involved in open source, and documentation can be a great place to start. I know some people disagree, and I disagree with them because that's where I started. I got my start in contributing to open source by writing some documentation. It's a great place to start. It helps you understand the project. It helps the project out. Contribute to open source projects if you want to write. You can also apply to write tutorials as a contractor. Um, DigitalOcean has our Write for Donations program, which is basically our program where we'll pay you as an author to write something, and then we'll pay $300 to a tech charity of your choice after you've written the article for us as well. So it's a win-win. You get some money. A good cause gets some money. If you're interested in this, you can go to do.co slash w4do, write for do. Every month we have a different set of... Uh, topics that we want people to write about, um, and you can apply and write and, you know, write some of these amazing tutorials that DigitalOcean is known for. And that's all I have for this time. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at Mason Egger. I tweet about random things and talk about cool stuff. Um, and you can also find these slides on my website at mason.dev slash speaking slash docs dash devs dash love. So thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it getting to present to you and have a great day and may your docs be better.